Mic's working? Okay, there we go. Good evening, and welcome to the September 14th, 2017, fiscal year 2019-2014 proposed capital improvement program, public hearing of the Prince George's County Board of Education. I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices as they interfere with the microphones and taping of the meeting. Thank you. The Board of Education has convened this evening for the sole purpose of receiving public commentary on the fiscal year 2019 to 2014 proposed capital improvement program. I'm sorry, 2024. <laughs> proposed capital improvement program. The Board of Education appreciates your participation in the CIP process. Only with the public's involvement will we be able to best meet the needs of our many students and staff in Prince George's County Public Schools. Ms. Berkeley, please call the roll. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Ms. Ahmed? Here. Ms. Boston? Present. Mr. Burroughs? I heard he's in the parking lot, so he should be in short. Ms. Eubanks? Here. Ms. Hernandez? Present. Mr. Murray? Ms. Page? Ms. Page? Present. <laughs> Ms. Quinceros Grady? Ms. Roach? Mr. Valentine? Mr. Wallace? Present. Ms. Williams? Dr. Wiseman? Dr. Eubanks? Thank you. Colleagues. I now yield the floor for a statement from the CEO's administration concerning the FY 2019 to 2024 capital improvement program. Thank you, Ms. Boston. Uh, we have a short presentation of this year's CIP uh, to present. It'll be about 10 or 15 minutes before we open the floor for, uh, for comment. Okay. And that'll be done by Elizabeth Chason, our CIP officer. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board, Vice Chair Boston, and PGCPS staff. Um, tonight is the public hearing for the recommended 2019 through 24 CIP budget. Um, our total combined state and county annual requests this year in FY19 is almost 307 million. Excuse me, they're saying they don't think your mics. You know, it, Can the sound people um, turn? They're working on it. You try it now. Try it now. Can you hear me now? Now? Yes? Oh, okay. All right. Good. I won't have to lean over. I know you have a soft voice, so if you could just talk up a little bit, it'll help. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, so um, tonight is the public hearing for the recommended 2019 through 24 CIP budget. Our total combined state and county uh, annual request in FY19 is almost 307 million, of which 230.6 million is requested of the county. Um, prior to co public comments, we're going to quickly review the slide presentation. Um, it's from the board meeting um, from October 24th, 2017, and it's posted on our CIP web pages. Um, as part of this presentation, we will also review our project accomplishments for the fiscal year and reconcile the final adopted FY18 CIP budget, which started July 1st, 2017. So welcome new board member, student Amanya Page. It's nice to see you. Um, let me move this forward. All right, so building a successful CIP. Capital Programs, of course, is in charge of making sure students have the facilities they need to be successful. Um, without a fully funded CIP, the vision in the EFMP, or Educational Facility Master Plan, cannot be implemented. Uh, the vision is to deliver a lean fleet of facilities that efficiently and fully support modern education and are in a state of good repair over the next 20 years. Uh, the department now includes boundary analysis for a coordinated strategic response. Pupil accounting no longer performs uh, school boundary 
studies, and we have added Rihanna McCarter, um, our boundary specialist formerly with pupil accounting, to our team, just to note. So our FY 2017 accomplishments, um, the status of projects, we have more than 300 active facility improvement projects that the capital programs and building services staff are currently working on. Uh, much of our work is completed over the summer months, so we really just finished um, a number of projects. 21% uh, of them were completed or substantially complete as of June 30th, 2017, and of course now more are. Um, 15%, you'll know, of our projects are pending or on hold, and this could be due to uh, lack of funding or lack of a project manager due to vacancies. Projects that are substantially completed, there are 111 of them. Um, as of June 30th, almost 70 of them were compliance projects. Compliance projects are facility modification, uh, and work required by federal, state, or local regulations, and they guarantee that we are providing safe, supportive environments to our students and staff. The majority of these projects were upgrades to kitchen grease traps to meet WSSC regulatory codes in more than, our, more than 200 facilities. We completely renovated and replaced certain buildings. Um, among those were Eugene Burroughs or Akakik Academy, which opened last August, and then this year Fairmont Heights and Glen Arden Woods opened in September. We've completed secondary school reform projects, which are often interior renovations that support the integration of career and technology education within the proposed high school academies. Um, so we completed SSR projects at nine high schools by the start of the year this year, um, and most of those were wrapped up over the summer. We also completed about 25 systemic projects. These include the uh, replacement of major operating systems in the buildings. Examples include boilers, chillers, roofs, heating and cooling systems. Um, these projects are implemented to improve the comfort and effectiveness of the buildings and are essential to high-achieving students in a high-performing workforce. We also completed a number of miscellaneous projects, which could include gym floors, bleachers, stormwater management, playground equipment. Uh, most of these are county-funded. They don't include state dollars. So our 2017 Educational Facility Master Plan and the Six-Year Strategic Plan. Uh, Prince George's public, County Public Schools is the second largest school system in the state of Maryland and the 19th largest in the United States. So we have more than 200 school buildings, and in order to continue down the road to high student achievement, more of these capital pro projects need to be completed in the next few years. We approved an ambitious 20-year capital improvement program in the adopted FY17 EFMP. Minor amendments were made to the plan this year as required by the state, um, but the total amount of projected funds needed over 20 years has remained the same. We're still looking at 8.5 billion, or an average of 425 million a year. Our strategies remain the same. We're ramping up to full or limited modernization in the older schools for cycle one. We're addressing overutilization by building new schools, and we're addressing underutilization through planning studies. In cycle one, we have approximately 33 projects um, that are listed here for the first six years. Um, without adequate funding, however, we will have to delay some of the starts of these projects. So what we did is we grouped these into Cycle 1 projects by northern, central, and southern areas of the county to show that we have projects all across the county uh, planned for the next six years. The northern area is mainly districts 1, 2, and 3, but uh, note that the catchment areas for board and council districts do not align with each other. So. We've just shown the board districts on these maps. And this is a list of schools in the northern area. And then we pulled out a few examples to give you a feel for where these schools are and how much it costs to modernize each one. 
So for instance, we have Calverton Elementary School. It was built in 1964. It's outdated, critically overutilized, and needed an addition. This is $41.6 million. So it's expensive to uh, renovate schools or modernize them. Hyattsville Elementary School, it's also overutilized and in need of an addition. Um, the cost is $41.6 million, and this is inside the Beltway. You can see a different area from where Calverton was. And we have Spring Hill Lake Elementary School. Um, it was built between 1966 and 1978. It's also outdated, critically overutilized, in need of an addition. This is even more expensive, 58.9 million, and this is because it's a much larger elementary school. This is one of our largest ones at almost 800 students. In the central area schools, which is um, districts four, or five, and six, and a little bit of seven, um, you can see that it includes Tulip Grove, which is still being modernized um, and will open next uh, school year. It also includes Fairmont and Glen Arden Woods, which just opened. Benjamin Tasker is one of the schools in this area. It's built in 1970. Estimated cost is 86.3 million to modernize. Kenmore Middle School is 90.4 million, slightly more because it's actually going to grow to a 1,200 student school, our maximum size for um, a middle school. The Suitland High School campus, built in the 1950s, is 173.7 million. Um, it's probably one of our most expensive. It's a complicated campus. It includes the Center for the Visual and Performing Arts, one of our premier uh, magnet schools. In the southern area, we have uh, Akakik Academy, uh, which opened in 2017, along with William Schmidt at the very bottom. Um, Benjamin Stoddard Middle School is here. The estimated cost is $66 million. Gwynn Park High School, $105.1 million. And Potomac Landing Elementary School, at $32.3 million. So these are just some examples because sometimes when we show you a spreadsheet, right, and the numbers are just all jumbled together, it just seems like a lot of money, right? You pull them apart and look at them separately. Each one is important, but each one is a lot of money, which is why we have such a big uh, capital improvement program planned. So the final approved capital budget for FY uh, 2018. Um, it was reconciled and uh, state funding approved was for 60, 65 systemic projects. They ranged in cost from 129000 to nearly $3 million. Um, local funding for, for many more, such as compliance projects, let's say. Um, state approval of partial construction funding was given for limited renovations at C. Elizabeth Reeg and Bowie Annex. Um, there's still pending state approval for construction funding, full construction funding. Uh, funding not yet approved for the Stephen Decatur Middle School and William Schmidt Education Center renovations, but we are moving forward with design and planning. And that's one of the issues, right? As we commit ourselves to projects, we can't just stop, especially if we're under contract with an architect. We have to keep going. And that would be the case with, let's say, Stephen Decatur, right? We committed, we have the architect on board, and we're doing the design. Um, what you should note, though, is that the design is the least expensive part of modernizing a building. So it's, it's not a waste of money to, to go ahead and plan and design the uh, renovation of a building, but then pull back if you just don't have the money to go ahead with the modernization. And you'll note that um, each year since 2014, We've um, gotten slightly more from the state and the county, but we are still receiving only about half of what we're requesting, and this has been a continual problem. Um, we're really only getting about 140 million average. It was 166 million uh, for last year. So in the FY19 capital budget request, we are asking for more than 100 million. 
and combine state and county funds just for the modernization projects, not for compliance projects and all the other important projects that still have to keep going while we modernize buildings. The projected multi-year cost of these projects is approximately $736 million over the six-year period. More than half of these projects are approaching the design stage. We are completing the evaluation of architects for these projects um, right now. Um, today was our last day that we did some interviews. We will ask for approval of these contracts at the November board meeting. For this reason, we have not requested state construction funding for some of these projects because we'll just be designing them still. Um, we have requested smaller amounts of county funding to start the construction prior to the end of FY19 or June 30th, 2019. Uh, note that it takes approximately six to nine months to design these projects, depending on the size of the school, and another nine months or more to get them permitted. So we anticipate starting construction on some of them in spring 2019. Um, the design for Benjamin Stoddart and Kenmore, which are listed up here, they've already been delayed by more than a year due to lack of design funding. Um, and now recently in the approved FY18 budget, there's no design funding specifically for those projects. We continue to request a large amount of money um, to replace systemics, and we will have to keep doing that because heating and cooling in particular is obviously very important to our students, right? While we're modernizing buildings, we can't neglect the other ones that we have. Um, some of these projects are more comprehensive systemic projects like um, combining new windows with new HVA systems. So you can see, for instance, to White Eisenhower has a price tag of $13 million. That's probably about 30% of the cost of the building is, is in your HVAC or heating and cooling. And most of these buildings, they're past their 30, 40 year life cycle and they just need to be completely replaced. And this is the cost of them. We are still requesting a reimbursement of more than $9 million for our forward-funded projects, projects that we completed without um, the state's um, aid. Uh, the county funding for compliance projects will continue to be a necessary request uh, due to the age of the building inventory. Our request for air conditioning upgrades is more than $66 million, and major emergency repairs continues to be a high-need category because of all the deferred maintenance at our buildings. Our total combined request in FY19 is, again, almost $307 million, of which $230.6 million is requested of the county. This is double the amount we received last year. Um, but uh, note that although the combined funding has increased each year, it's just not enough to uh, maintain our buildings, and it's far from what we need to move from a reactive capital improvement program to a proactive one that modernizes schools. And this is the timeline for the FY19 um, budget. We, uh, we released the draft CIP document and made it available on our web pages about two weeks ago in time for the public hearing. And we are now ready to hear from the public what they think of our plan. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, we are now uh, here from our registered speakers for public comment. We have 15 speakers, and our first speaker is Delegate Eric Barron from um, Delegate of District 24. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Good evening. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Delegate Eric Barron. Uh, I'm a delegate representing the 24th Legislative District. Uh, I am here also on behalf of Senator Joanne C. Benson, uh, Delegate Jazz Lewis, and Delegate Carolyn J. B. Howard. Uh, and here in support of a, a uh, new uh, pre-K through eight school within I'll call it the greater 450 uh, Route 193 area, um, uh, specifically at the property owned by the school system already in the Fairwood community. 
Uh, this community encompasses parts of Woodmore, Glendale, Fairwood, and Mitchellville. Um, it's a priority of the 24th Legislative District and your state representatives, which means it's a priority of the state at this point. Um, the, uh, it's my understanding that there is a study pending. Uh, I'm confident that the study will demonstrate that this area is over capacity. The, the facilities are overutilized, uh, to use the words within the, the CIP, and the facilities are just inadequate and just won't do going into the future. And I can tell you this, uh, not just from personal experience, but from uh, hearing from uh, many of our constituents in the surrounding area, but also from the fact that we've had studies uh, about a decade ago that demonstrated just that. And nothing has changed since, except we have more people, more residents, more citizens, more children. Um, so we would ask, and I, th I think that this, uh, the study was just put out, uh, I think an RFP, or we, well, first of all, we'd like to see, this community would like to see a scope of, of that study. Uh, so if that could be provided, uh, whether it be to me or to, to members who are going to speak, that would be great. Um, but these, this should be fast-tracked since this has already been done. Uh, I know that the community looks forward to working with the school system on planning and design because actually we've been through that before. This community has been through that before, up to the planning and design phase actually. Um, so the community I know stands ready to partnership with the school system. Uh, your state delegation is ready to uh, partner with you, ready to fight for uh, those, those dollars that you just heard about. Um, but uh, we're asking that you work with us, that we, we fast track this, let's get this on board. There's a need here. You'll hear from many uh, of the members of the community here. And um, I look forward to working with you all. You've heard, heard this from me often, and you'll keep hearing it. And uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so I need to backtrack a little bit because I forgot to uh, actually read the guidelines for registered speakers. So uh, you have been registered to speak in a public comment form where, where the Board of Education will listen to your comments. The board will not address your comments. All registered speakers will have three minutes to make their presentation. At the sound of the buzzer, speakers may complete that sentence only. Registered speakers may not relinquish any part of their speaking time to another registered or unregistered individual. Speakers may not address individuals or issues with profanity or derogatory terms. You will be warned once. If you continue your comments, if you continue, your comments will be terminated and you may be asked to leave the meeting. Speakers are encouraged to use titles rather than names. For example, principal, CEO, Deputy Super Superintendent, et cetera. Please have a copy of your, com your statement in the file. Please place a copy of your statement in the file box located next to the microphone. Your adherence to these guidelines will enable the public participation process to move smoothly. So thank you. Our next speaker is a near Please forgive me if I mess up your name. So, Amir Rukh Kama? Yes, Anir Rukh Kama. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Anir Rukh Kama. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Fairwood Community Association um, that surrounds the land that the school board owns that we're looking for that we're looking to have as a site for a new school. I'm here to speak about the Woodmore Elementary Pre-K through eight Fairwood School Feasibility Study. Dear Board of Education members, I am here before you today because the Fairwood Community Association Board of Directors fully supports the Woodmore Elementary Fairwood School Pre-K through eight Feasibility Study in hopes that it leads to a school on the Fairwood site that was slated for Prince George's School over 13 years ago. We are encouraged by the initiation of the feasibility study and implore the board to continue support of the process 
by allocating additional monies for the planning stage that we expect will be supported by the study. Basically, we want you to do everything in your power to continue the progress toward a school in Fairwood. We do realize that a school in Fairwood is not just a Fairwood school. Multiple communities mentioned before will be a part of such a school. We would like to work with the other communities, the school board, and the school system in an organized way so that a school in Fairwood is fully able to educate our children in a way that allows them to maximize their potential and contribute to the, the most to society. In summary, we ask that if the feasibility study supports the building of a school in Fairwood, that you allocate funds for the planning stage as soon as possible. We ask that you include us in a collaborative way in the planning and future stages of the process to have a school on the Fairwood School site. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. If you'd like to leave a copy of your, uh, thank you. Uh, Michelle Jackson. Good evening. My name is Michelle Jackson and I have been a resident of Fairwood since 2004. I'm here tonight to advocate for a school in Fairwood that would be located on the 15 acres in Fairwood that Prince George's County Public School already owns. Between the years of 2006 and 2010, the Fairway Elementary School was in the CIP for planning, design, and construction. The school design was funded and was a very collaborative effort between the Fairwood Education Task Force and the architectural firm of Grimm and Parker. In 2010, the Fairwood School was in the number four state position in the CIP for $5 million for construction. Three million of that funding was provided by the county and two million was to be funded by the state. This is when things fell apart. In late 2010, Prince George's County Public Schools shifted sixth grade from elementary to middle school. Also, school boundaries were redrawn, and we were still in the recession. All of these factors had a detrimental effect on the school enrollment. So we were told that the state could no longer justify building a new school in Fairwood when there was now a large amount of school inventory. During 2011, discussions took place between Fairwood and Prince George's County Public School officials about the possibility of a K through eight specialty school in Fairwood. However, that would have necessitated that a full gym be added to the school design, which would have required an additional, at that time, 1.5 million, which was not approved. Fairwood has grown considerably since 2011. Currently, Fairwood has almost 1,600 homes and is on track to have 1,875 homes by 2021. Fairwood is a census designated place and according to the latest census data, the Fairwood CDP has over 1,000 children in the pre-K through grade eight age groups. Based on conversations with Prince George's County Public Schools and Board of Education officials, the average pre-K school in Prince George's County has approximately a 1,200 uh, student enrollment. Glendale Elementary is overcrowded, and Woodmore, um, it, ah, Woodmore Elementary has been on the list of small underutilized schools for years due to decline enrollment and the condition of the facility. Prince George's County Public Schools purchasing has confirmed that, and as you've heard tonight, that an RFP for a feasibility study of Woodmore Elementary was put out on August 30th. We are requesting that the Board of Education put the Fairwood School back in the CIP for planning and design pending the outcome of this feasibility study. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker, Deborah Sell. Good evening. For the record, my name is Deborah Sell, and, and I'm a recent re lo our family recently relocated to Fairwood. When I used to always testify here about special needs students. I was very impressed by the tenacity and scholarly effort put forth by the Fairwood Education Task Force. And that's one of the reasons that led my husband to want to move to Fairwood. We sincerely desire that this school be built and be put on the fast track. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Michael Bodie. Good evening, my name is Michael Bodie. I am the president of the Laurel High School Parent Teacher Student Association. 
when I'm here as a parent, uh, a community member, uh, to talk about Laurel High School, um, I was dismayed when I looked in the CIP and didn't see anything that addressed Laurel High School. And I wanted to point out certain things to make the board and the consultants and whoever's involved and is aware of what's needed. As you know, Laurel High School is the original high school in Prince George's County. Currently, it's probably one of the oldest buildings. I saw what Sutton was built in the 50s, but Laurel is similarly an older building. Four, five issues. Number one, major portions of the building do not have air conditioning. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very tough to hold a classroom of students' attention. I also, by the way, serve as a substitute teacher, so I'm speaking from experience. It's tough to educate in a hot classroom, typically a class of 30 to 35 students. In addition to the classroom, the cafeteria has absolutely no air conditioning. So it's tough to even eat, to get anything done in the cafeteria, to having meetings in the cafeteria. The front office has no air conditioning. So you can imagine the impression people, you make on people when they're looking to sign up for the high school and come in, and the front office is an oven. This summer, they did install some portable units, and that partially does the job, but we really need to consider doing better, especially since more and more people in that part of the county are transferring from private schools like Pilate into Laurel. So ask you for that consideration. Number two, the track is in wretched condition. I'm really concerned about students running track, maybe injuring themselves. The track needs serious work. It's terrible. The turf needs to be redone, football turf. We don't have locker rooms for kids to dress. They either come already dressed or dressed in some of the trailers. Finally, the parking lot is in bad condition. As a parent, I'm there often. As a substitute teacher, I'm there often. I can tell you personally, it's bad on your car. It's not apparent to me that anybody has spent time at Laurel, so I ask for consideration that please come to Laurel High School and don't forget about us in District 1. Thank you. Thank you. Anita. Stugen? Stugen? Good evening. Evening. My name is Anita Stugen, and I'm here as a parent as well as the vice president for Kenmore Middle School PTA. As you heard from the CIP report, um, Kenmore is on record to be fully renovated as well as expanded. However, the feasibility study as well as the design is on hold. Um, there are many issues uh, that the school has that need to be addressed before the renovation can even take place, especially since we're still um, actively moving forward as a school with students inside. So as noted in the, uh, in the report, Kim Moore Middle School has edu educational adequacy deficiencies, poor building systems, and is overutilized. Right now, um, the population is at 892, and I know that one of the reports said in 2014 that they are expecting um, the school to increase to 1,052 with a maximum population of 1,200. I believe we'll over, oversee that, especially since they tend to, they're looking to utilize Kenmore to uh, help, the, in, help the overutilization of other schools in the neighborhood. I have um, external and internal requests of repairs that need to be made. We have several temporaries on the property. There were seven last year. We had another one drop this year, so now there's a total of eight. The grounds there are messy. It's like the trucks just came in, did what they needed to do, and left the grounds the same. So the blacktops, when it rains, all of the mud goes into the blacktop, and it goes into the temporaries, and it's going into um, the school buildings as well, and of course the kids are muddy. 
And so we're asking for canopy, canopy or some type of covering for the blacktop. We're asking for the, the grassy areas to be fixed so that the continual erosions of the grounds don't continue to go into the blacktop. We're asking also for fencing to actually go onto the property because anyone from the outside can just walk into that area where the temps are as well as kids can just walk off the property. Uh, there are some blind spots there on the property so there's some safety issues there. There are also um, some structural repairs in my packet. I have included pictures. I have taken pictures of the issues with um, the temporaries as well as structural issues, wall repairs. We have an outdoor classroom where the concrete needs to be repaired and the wall, which is the building, <laughs> is falling apart. And then also there's some rusty materials in place. In the internal part of the building, I, we question the air quality. We definitely would like for that to be examined as well. I have pictures enclosed and a copy of the report. Right. Thank you. Horace Jameson. Good afternoon, board. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm not sure how much of an impact this is going to be, um, you know, going to be uh, with me just speaking. But I wanted to. I'm speaking on behalf of Glendale Elementary. Um, I have a son who's a special needs student there, and I want to talk about Glendale Elementary because it seems to be a very under, underserved school. Um, the school was built in 1928. So you guys talk about old schools. It's a very old school. Another wing was built in 1950 and another wing in 1970. But um, even with that, uh, we still have to have, we have some temporaries outside that are 25 years plus old. Um, the school is overcrowded. Uh, you heard a lot of folks from Fairwood come up and talk about it. Um, the overcrowded. Some of those, some of those actual um, students are coming over to Glendale Elementary. And, uh, and the area itself is just overcrowded. Um, and folks are coming into the school. The school now has about 580 um, students there. Um, it's underfunded. The infrastructure is falling apart. And um, what I mean by that is um, um, there's no AC. Um, there's basically um, my kids spent about a month in another classroom because that classroom didn't have any heat in that classroom. Um, the school has a cafeteria that serves as its gym and its auditorium. On rainy days like yesterday, my kid and all the other kids have to stay within the classroom because they have nowhere to go. Um, it's just unacceptable. Um, the front office can't even plug in more than two or three devices within an electrical outlet without blowing a fuse. So you got a lot of infrastructure problems there at the school. Again, it doesn't seem like anybody has come out to take a look at the school. I haven't seen us on any of the cycle um, planning. Um, and um, I've sent emails to all the way up to Dr. Maxwell asking to just have someone come out and take a look at our school. Um, it's in bad shape. It's in really bad shape. Um, and I haven't got the responses that I've needed. And I'm sure I've seen you, some of you have seen my name on, on emails that I've sent up to the school. Um, I'm hoping that we can get somebody to come out. I'm hoping that, again, that um, I'm not sure how much of an impact that me speaking is going to have in terms of moving Glendale up on that priority list, but I hope we are able to get something done um, on behalf of Glendale Elementary. Thank you. Thank you. Zanita White Holmes. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Zanetta White Holmes, and I'm a parent, um, chairperson of the Melwood Elementary PTA Safety and Security Committee. I'm former PTA president and public school education advocate. I come to you with a construction funding request for capital improvements consisting of a parking lot and bus loop project at Melwood Elementary School. For years, we've been told that the new driveway and bus loop will be constructed at the school. Um, I have documentation from a CIP budget dating back from 2013 that $300,000 was allotted to the school for the parking lot renovation, but the, but the money never reached the school and the work hasn't been done. Earlier this year, I inquired about this to capital programs and was told that the estimated cost of the parking lot renovation and bus loop was more than $300,000, that they actually are now estimating a cost to be 750,000. Um, the construction of the bus loop and renovation 
of the parking lot will present a safe traffic management solution on school grounds for buses, parents, children, and the school community. I stand before you to ask for the full construction funding of 750000 or uh, the estimated cost to date to be added to the CIP budget for Melwood Elementary School for a bus loop and parking lot renovations. Thank you. Next speaker is Christopher Langston. Purvis Beringer. Good evening, my name is Purvis Beringer for the record and I thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, why a new pre-K um, school within Fairwood? I'm biased because I have a child in Glendale Elementary and one that's coming uh, for the next year. Uh, when we moved into uh, the Fairwood community, uh, there were plans uh, or blueprints that said that there was going to be a school. Seven years later, there is no school. We put our kids through private school, and private school in this area is between ten dollars to $13,000, depending upon the age. Uh, that money deserves to go back into the school system. As you've already heard in reference to the CIP projects, 40% of the projects that are currently in construction, they are nearing completion. Let's just add one more to the, uh, to the slate, and that will be the new school within Fairwood. I would like to offer a quote to everyone here, and it says, PGCPS is still working toward realizing the goals set forth in its education facilities master plan. We're addressing the overutilization by building new schools, addressing underutilization, and over the next five years, PGCPS hopes to build five new schools, renovate or replace 13 elementary, 10 middle, and three high schools. So let one of those schools for your consideration be the new school in Fairwood. And as you've already said, as one of uh, a fellow resident has already stated, Glendale Elementary is overcrowded. So uh, if you don't believe us, just try driving up there in the morning, and you're gonna have to park across the street to get into the facility. And uh, it is almost a nightmare if you go to the back for pickup and drop off. And then lastly, what I would like to say is that uh, PG County, as we already know, is one of the wealthiest African-American communities within the U.S., and it has some great homes. So let the school be a reflection of the great homes and let it not be dilapidated anymore. Thank you for your consideration. Stacy Pompey. Belinda Queen. Good evening to all of you, Madam, sitting in this chair. I'm Belinda Queen. I am elected official for the 25th District Democrat Central Committee. I am speaking on behalf of my district. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the many schools in the area that have led, mold, mildew, and infected with rodents. All schools in a CIP plan should be fully renovated and modernized to a quality standard for all kids. I challenge each and every one of you elected and appointed to have a vision and a dream for our children and put them first and have schools, all of our schools qualify for the 21st generation. I hold you accountable as elected officials and appointed officials to come out to the communities, speak to the communities, talk to the PTSAs, know what's going on in the community, and know the needs of the parents. I understand the needs of the new schools for the new home, but we have many homes and many schools that have been sitting there for years that are in older communities that are established. They need to be replaced and modernized. Many of our houses and cars after 10 years, five years, are replaced and modernized. A lot of our schools, like Central High School, has not been replaced, but the school is older than me. We have a lot of issues that are going on. The CIP is all, I've read many pages. I challenge you also 
going through it, 360 some places was really hard. I thank you for the presentation. And you talked about a lot of things that I want to talk about, like Walker Mill Middle School, which I live three houses from, the HVAC system. And not only the HVAC system, the windows are so old, they go back to the 19th century. They need to be replaced. There's a lot going on in that school. It needs to be modernized. Like North Forestville, where my granddaughter teach, um, is at, the roof does need to be repaired among a lot of other issues that are going on in school. Trying to read the CIP was really hard. I think you need to break it down in each school board member, make it a lot easier for the residents, bring it to us. I, I truly appreciate the way she broke it down, but I think as school board members, you should break it down to your district. Anything that attend to your district, you should be letting the people know. You are elected and appointed to keep us engaged and informed and empowered. To see what is done now, as I stated about North Forestville, a lot of these schools need to be renovated. They go back to the, um, the 1980s. Um, as I stated already, they were affected. I think that we need to plan that every school, as I did say, should be modernized. And I challenge you to sustain and to build overdue new, a new central high school and fully modernized Walker Mill Middle School, Capitol Heights Elementary School, John Bain, District Heights, Spring Hill Lake, Highsville, and I can go on and on. It seemed like we are behind, and going up in Central High School looked like a prison. Prince George's County do have quality schools and quality teachers, and I just ask you to make our schools quality into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Kobe Langley. Hello, my name is Kobe Langley. I'm the Senior Vice President of the American Red Cross. Uh, we have a lot going on, uh, so I'll be brief. I had to drive out here two hours from Arlington, Virginia, where we're responding to the largest disaster uh, in American history for the past 30 years. Uh, but this is important as well, which is why I'm here. Um, I'm also a resident of Fairwood, Bowie Fairwood, and have been a resident for the past five years. My wife and I moved to Bowie Fairwood from Anne Arundel County uh, when we had a young daughter. She is now six years old, and she is not in Prince George's County Schools. She goes to school in Anne Arundel County, where my wife works. Uh, the reason she is there is uh, because one of the reasons we moved to Fairwood was the promise of this new school, uh, which has yet to come. Uh, so uh, this is an education process for me. I was really interested as to why that wasn't the case. After doing a little bit of research, um, I did as uh, any good son would do, and I called my mom for help. Uh, both my parents are career educators, 30 years in the Denver public school system. Many of my aunts and uncles were also board members in Denver. And I asked them, um, what should I say to this board? Uh, what should I share with them about Fairwood that might convince them to look a little bit more favorably upon this request? And what they told me surprised me, so I'm going to share with you what they told me and what my response is to that. They said, most school board members really want to hear about the community. Uh, they want to know, are there school aid parents in the community? Are there children in the community? So I did a little bit, a little bit of research. The median age of Fairwood residents is 37. 85% of them are families. That compares to 40% median age for Prince George's County and 50% that are married. They want to know that this is an educated community, and they want to know that it's a community uh, that is able to sustain and support the school. The average income of, of Fairwood community members is $91,230. Prince George's County is $75,000. Over 97.3% of Fairwood residents have high school education, 66% have a bachelor's degree or higher, and one out of every three Fairwood residents has a graduate degree or professional degree. They want to know um, whether or not the community is a community that can sustain and support a school as a community. Fairwood, if you haven't visited, is a beautiful, beautiful community. It has wonderful recreational facilities, has a wonderful soccer field, uh, it has a beautiful community center, and it has residents that love each other and support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Barika Smith.
Good afternoon. My name is Barika Smith, and I am one of the residents that he is speaking of and actually fits all the percentages that he did speak of. My family and I moved from California to Bowie, Maryland to live in Fairwood because of all the great things that we've heard about it. There are other residents who have moved from California who live in Fairwood. We understood that there was going to be a school put there. We were very excited about it. And taking my daughter to kindergarten to Woodmore at a really old facility really broke my heart. My parents are educators. My aunts and uncles are educators. So I believe in public education. But I do have the capability of putting my children in private school. And that's not what I want to do. The land is available. The kids are there. And there are many children of kindergarten age going on into eighth grade who would benefit from having a school put in the Fairwood community. And everything that Kobe said is a beautiful community. Yes, we can sustain it. Yes, we want it there. And I would really appreciate if you would consider going back to what was stated, that there was going to be a school there, that there should be a school there. The kids deserve it. The kids do not deserve to be in old, dilapidated facilities where the classrooms are inadequate. There's not bathrooms in the kindergarten classroom where you're constantly having to add teachers every year because everybody's moving to Fairwood. It's a beautiful place. And I do not like to be in a place where say, oh, well, Prince George's County is this and that and it's bad. You need to be in Anne Arundel County. That's not the case. I chose Prince George's County because of the statistics, the statistics of the county. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I want to stay here. But with the, there not being this new school added, we may consider leaving. And that's not what we want to do, basically, because we came all the way here from California. So I'd really appreciate if you would consider the new school to be put in Fairwood community because there are many children who would fill that school up and it would be perfect for the community. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Jonathan Brown. Good evening. I'll be quick. I'm the last person that's in between you and the door, so I won't try to be too long-winded. My name is Jonathan Brown. I'm the secretary for the Fairwood uh, Board of Directors. I'll be speaking on my behalf. Uh, near articulately spoke on the behalf of the board. A number of community members have kind of said a, a number of things. I don't want to reiterate their concerns, but as far as I am concerned, there is a cloud that exists over Prince George's County, and it's the educational system. It's going to hamper our investments or economic, economic development, whether or not corporations want to come here or not, because of the poor perception of the school. Like the lady who just spoke, um, a new, I just got married. We married for a year. My wife is a nuclear engineer. I'm a program manager. We just get married. We're going to buy a, buy a house in Fairwood. We're excited. We tell our coworkers, and they look at us with a sickening look on our face. You're going to live in Prince George's County? The school system is terrible. You have a daughter. Don't you care about her? That, that is the unique reaction that you receive from people when you tell your people, you tell folks that this is the education that you're giving for your child. My daughter was stuck in the classroom at Woodmore Elementary where there were 50 kids in a fifth grade class. We were being taught math, science, English. She came home every single night crying, feeling like a failure because 50 kids would not stop yelling and the teacher, who was a substitute by the way, because her teacher got cancer, could not teach. We had to tutor her. My wife stayed up to midnight. It was a terrible, it was a horrible experience. There, there has to be almost a, a Metro type of, uh, you know, Paul, uh, director, CEO of Metro, a back to good program for our school system. You saw the issues and the problems. Part of that back to school, back to good program needs to be a program. We are designing schools that are getting kids either into careers or colleges. When you walk into Woodmore, and as I took my daughter to Benjamin Tasker, when you walk into there, that's not the feeling that I get. That's not the feeling she gets. Um, tonight, you have a projector screen. We recently went there for parents' night. The lights turned off. It was dark. I couldn't take notes because she didn't have a projector screen, and that's how you had to project the picture. Um, that's not an expensive fix, and that's probably bare minimal to bring uh, technology into the classroom. Um, you are public servants. You care or you wouldn't be here. I know that. But dilapidated is an understatement. Uh, not funded is an understatement. 
we have to show people outside of the community that we care about our education. And what would any person do if you're a coach of a football team or anything like that? You buy new uniforms, you get a new locker room, you show, you make the students inside of the school feel proud. That's where the Fairwood Community School comes in. You don't need to renovate Woodmore or renovate Benjamin Tasker. You need a brand logo and name, brand new. And I actually strongly consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes this evening's public comment. I want to thank you for your comments. The Board of Education is scheduled to approve the final submission of the 2019 to 2014 CIP at the September 19, 2017 board meeting. So I hope you can come to that. Okay, this 14th, 2019-2014 CIP public hearing. Thank you.